<laughs> Once all the greetings have finished, please be seated. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Christ Church this morning. It's my pleasure to be here again to welcome a visiting minister. And the reason on this occasion is that Alistair is in New York preaching at the Brick Presbyterian Church as part of their 250th anniversary celebrations. Uh, you may remember Barry established something of a link between the churches, and it's rather nice that they have reached out to Christ Church to be part of, of their uh, this milestone celebration. And that gives me the opportunity to welcome back to Christ Church Alan Garrity. It was just coincidence that Alan was going to be on the island for the week or the Sunday that Alistair is away, and so it was put to um, Alan. I'm sure you will want to come and preach to the congregation again, won't you? <laughs> he, of course, gave the right answer. We'll be hearing about something similar in our New Testament reading, where there's, uh, the right answer is sometimes not so easy to find. It's great to welcome Alan back. For those who don't know Alan, um, he and Elizabeth were in Bermuda from 1999 to 2008, uh, where Alan was minister of Christ Church. If you go out to the vestry, you'll see his picture hanging on our uh, rogues gallery of former ministers. And it's a real pleasure to welcome him back to Bermuda just for this one week, and for, in particular for this Sunday. So Alan, thank you very much for coming and being with us today. Thank you, Doug. That was a better introduction than the 8 o'clock service. <laughs> it's great to be back. It's great to be among friends. It's great to see you again and to share worship with you on this Sunday. It's a real joy to be in Bermuda. People say to me, do you miss it? And I say, of course I do. I love where I live. I enjoy my involvement in the church in Scotland, but I miss being with you. It was one of the highlights of my career to be with you for all those years, uh, and I enjoyed it very much, and my wife did too. So we're back for this Sunday, and I'm happy to be leading worship. And although you're not paying me for doing this, <laughs> I, I, th I think we're out for a bit nine dinners, so that counts. <laughs> Liz, I think, oh, I, something I did say uh, at the eight o'clock service was that two things I did, which I think you have all benefited from immensely. One, Doug was the session clerk. Uh, I introduced him to that, and he's been your session clerk. And Liz was the secretary. And what a great pair they are. Um, and so, well done. And Duncan, too. There. Okay. Thank you, Alan. I told him just a little while ago, I never in all my life would have believed that I would have been standing up here on this side of the communion table with him. As, as he says, our relationship um, as boss and secretary <laughs> have gone on since, two <laughs> since um, the year 2000 when I started in January. So... Anyway, our notices for this morning. Uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday coming, we have Bible study at 7.30 in the West Hall, and you're all invited and encouraged to come. On Saturday, the 28th of October, next Saturday, we have our annual end-of-summer barbecue at the manse from 6.30. We have a Halloween theme, so I'm hope we're hoping that the children in particular will come in costume. Adults is optional. Uh, tickets will be on sale after the service, and Mary van der Weg will be in the reception desk in Thorburn Hall to uh, sell you a ticket. So please stop there on your way for refreshments. Next Sunday at both services, we have our harvest services 
I think Alan started those as well. We've tweaked them a little bit, but... Uh, and you were encouraged to bring produce and put them in front of the communion table, and that will be taken after the later the service to Lorraine Rest Home and the Salvation Army. So that's next Sunday. The following Saturday, we're going to have grave painting here at the church, so bring, put your old clothes on and bring a paintbrush or a roller so that we can get the graves in tip-top condition in time for Christmas. On November the 5th, we, Sunday, after the later service, we have a 90th birthday celebration. There were originally five ladies who um, celebrate their 90th birthday this year that we're aware of. One of them has sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago, and that was Lillian Monkman. So there are four left, but only two want to be recognized. So we will have a celebration uh, on lunch on the 5th of November. <clears throat> and on the 11th of November, the music and dramatic group, the MAD group, is going to put on their production of Remember with dinner from 6.30, and that's songs from the two world wars. Um, if you have email, a, a poster was sent to you with that information earlier in the week. Um, and, of course, the fair is coming up on the 18th, so I hope you're clearing out closets and um, making jams and jellies and making Christmas decorations, and uh, that we'll have another year, good year. Last year, I think we had a record uh, profit, so that was great news, so we need to follow on that. And uh, those are all our announcements for today. Let us worship God and sing together hymn 167, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. In the midst of a world where people hunger and thirst, where people are abused and oppressed, let us reflect on our role in this world. Confess where we fall short and give thanks for our many blessings. Let us pray. Lord God, our maker and redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and guide us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord, 
Be merciful and forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and seen people in need, but have not gone to their aid. Lord, be merciful and forgive us our sin. We have seen evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful and forgive us our sin. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. And we have not loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, be merciful and forgive us our sin. Almighty God, we know we have not always looked after your world as we should, have not always helped others as we should, and have not always sought to do your will. Father, open our eyes to your truth and strengthen us to do your will. Living Father, we turn to you in times of need and we thank you for the grace you have given, given us to overcome hardship. Father, we live in a world of plenty and we thank you for the countless blessings. We thank you for the crops that have flourished and the food we have to eat. We thank you for the, all the joys we experience. We thank you for our friends and for this church and this congregation and the support we receive. Father, we particularly thank you for walking with us as we travel on life's pathways. And we pause now to think individually of the times you have been particularly close to us. We are blessed to do your works in the world and we ask you to continue to walk with us and to guide us and to help us spread your love. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, boys and girls, I'd like you to come out. I've something I want to share with you. Well, it's lovely to see you all. Just come a wee bit closer. That's good. I did something a few months ago that I've never done before. I find that hard to believe for somebody from Scotland to say they've never been to a big football match. And I went to a football match. I was, I was working for the church in Rome for the whole of the month of April. And I was preaching in the Church of Scotland there. And my daughter from America and her family came out and said, my children would love to go to a soccer match. <laughs> and so we went to the Olympic Stadium, Stadio Olimpico, maybe Olympica. And we saw Roma versus Atalanta. And this is what it was like. Can you hear that? Can you hear it in the traps, can you? And it went on like that throughout the whole of the match, except when Atalanta scored <laughs> and then it was silent <laughs> who won I haven't come to that bit yet <laughs> actually nobody won <laughs> but it was silent and then half time and you could feel that the Roma fans were a bit on edge what will happen next? And then just after halftime, 
Roma scored. My goodness, they were up in their seats. They were shouting, yelling. They were so happy. You could tell they were fans of Roma. They, were, they thought the Roma players were fantastic. I'm going to tell you a wee story. A story a long time ago about a scientist. And he was standing outside a garden and the garden was surrounded by a fence and he was a wee boy and he put his hand through the fence can't do it here and then he put his head <laughs> carefully through the fence and he said my hand and my head are on one side of the fence and my heart and my legs are on the other side. Whose side am I on? And, pardon? The middle, the middle, yeah. Good for you. Yeah, your parents didn't get that. (laughs) And so he, he said to himself, I have made a discovery today that I had never made before. And he told a group of scientists later on, I made a discovery You can't be on two sides at the same time. You can't support Roma and Atalanta at the same time. You can't support St. George's and Somerset (laughs) at the same time. And that's what Jesus is saying. When I come to you, I want you on my side. You can't be on God's side and not on God's side at the same time. I want you to be one of my fans. That's what Jesus is saying. And so I hope you remember that little story about Roma and Atalanta and about Michael Faraday, the scientist, and remember that God wants you to be on his side. We're going to sing your song, your hymn. All of us are going to sing it. It's hymn 523. Hands to work and feet to run. Can you hand some of those out, please? Thank you. Can you hand some of those out, please? Thank you. Can you hand some of those out? Can you hand some of those out? Hand them around your friend. Hands to work, feet to run. Now a prayer specially for you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you specially, in Jesus, you specially loved children. You said how important they were and that having faith like children was the way to get closest to you. So we ask you to bless our children. Bless them today. Bless them in what they learn in Sunday school and bless them throughout the week that lies ahead. We ask our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Do I take these?
Hear the word of God proclaimed in the New Testament, the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. <coughs> Excuse me. From chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And you can find that on page 203 in the New Testament section of the Bibles in your pew. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in, in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Amen. Just a short time before I left, I discovered what a gift we have in our organist and what a wonderful pianist he is. And so I asked him if he would just play something meditative. And in the presence of God, sitting together, we listen to what music can say to our spirits as well as words. And so Oliver is going to play Claire de Lune.
Our Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 22, reading verses 15 to 22. This can be found on page 24 in the New Testament section of the Bibles in the Pew. Matthew 22, reading from verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test? You hypocrites, show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give, therefore, to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and left him and went away. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his holy word, and his name be all praise and glory. Amen. We continue our worship singing hymn 600, Spirit of God unseen as the wind, gentle as is the dove, hymn 600. Please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first words ever written in the New Testament are the words we read today from 1 Thessalonians. Before any of the Gospels were written, these are the very first words. They may even be the first Christian words ever written after the birth of Jesus, which have been kept and passed down through the centuries, which we can read today. Isn't that amazing? These, the scholars tell us, are the first words 
of the New Testament. Paul has been preaching in the Greek province of Asia. In the middle of major difficulties and obstacles, he has a vision one night, and a Macedonian appeals to him. Come over to Macedonia and help us. He leaves Troas in modern Turkey and travels to Europe, to Thessalonica, a major city in the transnational highway running east-west across the Roman Empire. A key situation for growing the new faith. So when Paul writes these words, he was probably creating the first ever written text in Europe and in the world. I'm sure you all know the lectionary. And before I came here uh, to, for this Sunday, I was informed by Liz that you now use the lectionary. So this is a new sermon. <laughs> uh, and this is the lectionary reading for today. The first words ever written in the New Testament to the new tiny group of Christians living in a large pagan hostile environment. They weren't even called Christians at the time. Let's listen again to some of what he wrote in a different translation. From Paul to the congregation of Thessalonians, grace to you and peace. I, we always thank God for you all and mention you in our prayers continually. We call to mind how your faith has shown itself in action. Your love in labor and your hope in fortitude. A few weeks ago, as I looked up one of my commentaries on these verses for this sermon, I saw a folded piece of paper inside the front cover. It was the printout of an email from one of our members, dated 25th of September, 2005. They had been sent an email and they forwarded it on to me. This is some of what it said. The congregation of Christ Church, the people come from all walks of life, young and old. They are very kind, caring, and generous people. They are quick to help others in need. They are compassionate people. With faith in their hearts, they come to worship God and enjoy the peace and comfort of the church. They are warm-hearted. They reach out to help others when there is a specific need. What a compliment to you. What a wonderful compliment. In a way, what Paul said to the Thessalonians and the email said about Christ Church, they're really very similar. Paul says to the Thessalonians, their faith has shown itself in action. The love shown itself in labor. The hope shown itself in fortitude. That's a forerunner of the famous first letter of Corinthians chapter 13 when Paul says, in a word there are three things that last forever. Faith, hope, and love. The same three. Here in Thessalonians, Paul expands that thought in a different way. Faith has shown itself in action. Faith is what we believe. But faith has to be communicated not only in words of belief, but in positive action because of what we believe. The work of faith is what Paul says is the faithful service that is the natural product of faith. So Paul thanks God for faithful action. The love has shown itself in labor, Paul says, to highlight the relationship between the love we profess 
and the work we do because of the love we profess. Paul thanks God for the love they have shared through their hard work because of the hard work they have done because of their faith. And then Paul, to complete the faith, hope, love trio, speaks of their hope and fortitude. Paul encourages them, saying, in effect, what they share is the kind of hope that keeps on hoping. It keeps on keeping on in the face of difficult situations. We've all known, we've all known the need to dig deep and keep going. In the worst of times, but even in the best of times, we've known failure. There's nothing unusual about that. It happens partly because of circumstances, partly because not one of us in church is perfect, and partly because of situations beyond our control. Paul recognizes that, and so should we. So Paul thanks God for their determination in the face of such difficulties. Paul's practical advice to the Thessalonians is this. Faith and action are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are dynamically linked together. You can't call what we have as faith if it doesn't actually lead to some action. The new Christians at Thessalonica have been transformed by the belief in Christ, but that means they are responsible to be faithful in what they do day in and day out. What happened in Thessalonica, because of their faith in what they believe, which made them take action, because of the love which drove them to positive work for other people, and because of the hope which kept them being faithful in the face of difficulties, what happened in Thessalonica? The Thessalonians have become an example to other new churches. Because of all that they are and all that they do, Paul writes to them, we always thank God for you all. My experience when I was your minister was that you shared your faith you supported one another. You were active in local projects. You created and supported the work of Bermuda Overseas Mission among other local charities and ventures. And you have continued to do similar things through loads of love and other projects too. Brennan Manning, a priest, tells the story of a fellow priest. While he's walking in the Irish countryside, the priest sees an old peasant by the side of the road and he's sitting there praying. He's impressed and he says to the man, you must be very close to God. The old man looks up from his prayers and smiles, yes, God is very fond of me. I think that people who know they're loved by God, who know that God is very fond of them, are motivated to share their faith in committed love and action for the benefit of other people. So whatever we face in the future, Never forget, we are loved by God. There's something else in Paul's first written words in Europe, in the world, and in the New Testament. The second sentence reads, grace to you. 
There's a story, and Doug was telling me he heard a different version of it, and you may have too. There's a story that Thomas Wheeler, the CEO of the Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company, and he tells this story against himself. And he and his wife are driving along an interstate highway, and they notice that they are low on gas. So he left the highway at the next exit and found a rundown station, gas station, with a lone attendant. He asked the lone attendant to fill the tank and check the oil, and he went away for a wee walk to stretch his legs. And as he was returning to the, the car, he noticed that the attendant and his wife were having a lively conversation. And as he approached, they stopped talking. He paid the attendant. As he was getting back into the car, he saw the attendant wave to his wife and heard him say, it was great talking to you. As they drove out of the garage, he asked his wife if, he, if she knew the attendant. She said she did. They had gone to high school together and they had dated steadily for about a year. Boy, you were lucky I came along, he <laughs> boasted. If you had married him, you would be the wife of a gas station attendant instead of the wife of a CEO. My dear, she said, if I had married him, he would be the CEO. <laughs> and you would be the gas station attendant. We never know, we never know exactly all that makes us who we are, but we can be sure of this. We are not where we are as a result only of our own actions. I wish to suggest this morning that what makes us the best we can be are the people and God who work on us with love and grace. Paul knew how vital grace was. He focuses on it on the first two dozen words in the New Testament. Grace means that there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. Grace means there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. Grace means that God is very fond of us. As Christian men and women, we live with God's grace in our lives. The call of God to each of us is to share God's grace through our lives. And the second reading today also is part of the lectionary readings for today. And when I saw them together, I thought they don't seem to match up, but I think you'll find they do. In the gospel reading in St. Matthew, Jesus responds to the treachery of the Herodians and the Pharisees who can't stand one another, but only stand together in their hatred of Jesus. The trick question about whether or not it's lawful to pay taxes to the emperor seems at first little to do with faith, hope, and love, or with grace and peace. But Jesus does not divide the world into two equal empires, defining boundaries between our obligations to Caesar and our obligations to God. Jesus' answer recognizes our obligation to the state, but underlines our prior committed obligation to God, which transcends the rights and allegiances any empire might demand for itself. In effect, Jesus says we belong first and foremost to God. We may divide our budget, but we can never divide our allegiance. 
That, I reckon, is what Paul saw in the Thessalonian church. And that is why you could say that the Thessalonians have become an example to other new churches. And that is what we are all called to be as Christians and as members of Christ's church. And we know that because God is very fond of us and because God's grace means that there is nothing we can do to make God love us more, we know we are challenged to express our faith in practical terms, to share the love we have experienced through working for other people and to live with a persistent hope which encourages us day after day. That's the challenge. That's what it means to be a Christian. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for all that you have been to us, all the encouragement and love and hope you've given us over the years. Keep on supporting us that we may keep on sharing you and serving you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One of the things about being retired is you get your own minister. You sit in the pew and you get a minister too. And our new minister, I'll say that again, our last new minister, he left. <laughs> He's gone to another church in Scotland. He introduced me to the next hymn we're going to sing, which was written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a professor in Germany. He had the option of going to America to be free from Germany during uh, the, the Second World War. But he decided to stay in Germany. And in fact, at one point, he was part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. He was found out, imprisoned, and assassinated. But this hymn, these words, were written by him in his situation in prison. Uh, and I think that context allows us to sing what we sing with greater meaning. Hymn 393, we turn to God.
We now offer our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Loving and generous God, who created our world and all that is in it, we honor and praise you. We live in this beautiful island and sometimes forget to thank you for it, for the beauty that surrounds us, for the rainfall that sustains us, and for our families and friends who uplift us, we thank you. So often, we turn to you only in times of trouble or hardship. Help us to remember that you are there for us always. When doubt or confusion cloud our thinking, when things have not gone our way, when we have lost a loved one or had a troubling diagnosis, we turn to you for comfort and reassurance, for it is then that we feel we need your presence and guiding hand the most. Like a warm, soft blanket, your love surrounds us and protects us. Thank you for these special times. We pray that we will remember to thank you too for the good things that happen in our lives. The birth of a baby, the promotion at work, the love and help given to us by others the food on our table, for they are all part of your love towards each one of us. Thank you for these special times. Sometimes doubt creeps into our faith, but we must remember that this is not a bad thing. For when we wrestle with our lack of belief, through the cloud a new understanding will emerge, making our faith stronger in the end. Thank you for these special times. Give us to the desire and willingness to help others in the midst of our busy lives. We don't have to give the world great works like Shakespeare, Michelangelo, or Chopin. We don't have to do great things to make a difference. We can make a great difference by doing small things graciously and by your grace. Thank you for these special times. Most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins that we might have eternal life. When we take the sacrament in remembrance that he died for us, may we think when partaking, I remember. Like Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians that we heard this morning, we remember others in our prayers. And now in a moment of silence, we bring to you those names for whom we ask for extra care and love. Let them know that you are with them. Loving and generous God, we pray for peace justice and reconciliation in our world, for those war-torn lands and the people living through the horrors of conflict, for those still battling to survive after the terrible floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, and fires that have destroyed their homes and all they hold dear, for those living under oppressive governments and regimes where the freedom we take for granted is denied for those struggling to put a roof over their heads and food on their tables. Let them know that you are with them so that they may feel your nearer presence. We pray too for the state of the Christian church throughout the world and in particular for this congregation that we, we may be a blessing to others. May our faith, love and service continue to grow so that we are living examples of you made in your likeness. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering will now be received. Hmm? Don't we mention that? No.
Thank you, choir. Thank you very much. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all the good things you have given us homes and family and friends and so many things which bless our lives. We bring to you what's yours. We ask you to use it through us for the good of this community and those beyond. Hear our prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us when we pray to say together, our Father, who art in heaven. We sing our closing hymn, hymn 153, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
और गो इन पीस to love and to serve the lord the grace of the lord jesus christ the love of god and fellowship in the holy spirit be with you this day and forevermore